I see people making a lot of the same mistakes. What I'd like to start with today is some do's, okay? When you're writing a paper, you want to pick a topic and then explore that topic deeply. It's particularly important with smaller papers to pick something that you are very interested in and then explore that one topic really deeply. Now, I know that we've all heard from writing teachers over the years that, you know, you need to focus your paper and you need to not try to do too much with it. But this is really really important when you're writing a philosophy paper, a theory paper in this amount of space. Pick a topic also that you that you like. Now you say it's all boring, it's all theory, I mean I'm just taking this class because I gotta take this class. Well then my best suggestion to you is when you are when you're going through your reading and by the way do the reading um, that is definitely a do do the reading I feel like I shouldn't even have to say that but it's apparent that I, I do because I've seen the papers be aware of your emotional reactions or your intellectual reactions to the ideas that you're reading maybe you're just super fascinated by an idea or maybe you think that somebody is just a utter moron for saying the things that they're saying the best thing to do is to keep a piece of paper or, or read next to your computer so that you can mark what quote it was that really caught your attention or, you know, mark up your book. I understand sometimes you don't want to do that because you want to sell your book back. Just keep a tally of what ideas you are drawn to, whether it's because you really like them or because you really don't like them. Um, and, and those are the ones that you'll go back to that you'll be able to write the best papers about. Now, once you've decided what that idea is, it's very important that you thoroughly understand the premise. And um, this has been a problem where people think that they understand the, the theorists or the philosophers that they're talking about. And because they don't, because they're missing some of the nuance or because they're just having a complete misunderstanding of what it is that the theorist is trying to talk about, you write... Um, possibly a well thought out paper, but it's based on the wrong foundation and so you really can't get anywhere with it because you're just, it's like going down the rabbit hole. You're not talking about something that's actually relevant to that theorist. So the easiest way to do that is just talk to Seth. Make sure that, you know, you go up after class uh, or you call him or you send him an email and you say, look, this is how I'm understanding this. I just want to fly it by you really quickly to make sure that that's the case. Talk to Seth. He's the most helpful teacher out there. He wants to help. He wants you to call. And people don't. Text. You can text. If that feels more comfortable to start with, do that. Theory and philosophy is about, it's about asking questions. Um, the And the best analogy I think uh, of for this is to ask questions like you're a child. Wonder like you're a child. Another thing is let go of looking for the right answer. That is not what theory and philosophy is about. If you go and you look for the right answer or you try to assert that you have the right answer, you're setting yourself up for failure. So this is not always the easiest thing to do. Sometimes it's really difficult to say, well, I don't have the answer. It doesn't mean that you can't wonder about what the answer is. And it doesn't mean that you can't create a, an approach or a treatment, which is a really common word to use in philosophy. Let go of looking for the right answer or looking for, oh, well, I'm just going to write an essay about this paragraph right here because that's what he asked me about. They're going to scare the shit out of you, especially if you haven't taken a class like this. Okay, let's get into some don'ts. Okay. Things not to do when you write a paper for Seth. Don't summarize everything. Don't summarize everything. It's like the most annoying thing in the world. This is not a book report, okay? And I promise you, Seth already knows the ideas. So he's not looking for you to tell him, oh, well, this is what the ideas are. Um, he's looking for you to demonstrate that you have a grasp on the ideas and also that you have a way of coming to them yourself, okay? Don't summarize the ideas. It's super annoying, okay? Don't do it. Um, don't use quotes from class unless it really significantly adds to your point. Or 
you have a new insight into it. Maybe you agree with what Seth said, but you think that there's a nuance that he didn't address. Or maybe you think that the theorist would actually sort of disagree with the example that he gave in class. Or maybe you disagree, um, and you have a reasoned explanation for it, okay? But if you use a quote in class, first of all, it's just, look at me, I was in class, whoop de freaking do you're supposed to be in class, you're in college, that's what you do. Um, and also, you might accidentally prove that you weren't paying as much attention as you thought you were, um, which is even worse. So don't use quotes from class unless there's a really, really good reason for it, and there really usually isn't. Don't do it. Don't start a paper. Don't include in a paper. Just don't do the Webster's Dictionary says the definition of happiness is blah, 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 blah. This isn't high school. And there's so many problems with using a dictionary definition that way. The philosophical problems with it. It's, um, it's the assumption that the dictionary is an absolute authority on something. It's a misunderstanding of the way that you can approach language and the way that it works, that there's an evolution to language. It also usually completely ignores the fact that theorists and philosophers give their own definitions for these words. Socrates gives his own definition of happiness in the Gorgias. Um, a, a weird one. I mean, one that I probably, I don't agree with. Um, but if you go with a Webster's Dictionary version of happiness, and you say, well, Socrates is wrong because the Webster's Dictionary says this, like, I mean, come on. It's, it's boring. It's unsophisticated. It doesn't have any thought in it. And it's just completely misguided. So don't do that. Now, if you want to use the dictionary, the best thing to do is use it for the etymology, all right? Use that first little section right after the word that explains the history of it, where it comes from. Now, often that will give you a lot of insight into why somebody's using a word. There's a great online resource. It's called etym online, e t y m online.com. And all that site is, is the etymology of words. It's, it's really kind of a cool site, and a lot of the times you'll be surprised at where words are coming from. Um, and it'll give you sort of a, a foothold in how to make some interesting points uh, with your words. Which leads me to the next point. You gotta be really cautious with your word usage. And this is something that I'm guilty of. I am often incautious with my words. On the most basic level, incautious word usage looks like, I believe Gorgias is talking about oratory. Really? <laughs> Did you just say that? Do you believe that the Gorgias is about oratory? Come on. A better sentence would be, Gorgias is talking about oratory. And that's passive, and that's a writing problem. But anyway, if you're not very careful about the words that you choose, you can unintentionally mean something entirely different. So be very careful with your words, and etimonline.com is a, a very good resource for that. Okay. And the last thing as far as today that I want to cover is don't cram, speed write, or turn in your first draft. That is a recipe for a C at best, if you're lucky. If you're smart and you're quick and you're clever, don't do that. Okay.